How do we approach spiritual formation in the digital age? In today's conversation with pastor and author Jay Kim, we look at spiritual development both for ourselves and for the people God has entrusted us to lead. Are you ready? Let's go. Hello, friends, and welcome to Front Stage Backstage. I'm your host, Jason Day, and I am super excited for today's conversation. Now, as you know, we come to you every single week, and we're all about encouraging and equipping pastors just like you for healthy, well-balanced leadership, both in life and ministry. We're proud to be a part of the Pastor Serve Network, and every week, along with these episodes, we provide resources so you can dig more deeply into the conversation and the topic at hand. And you can find those resources at pastorserve.org slash network. So be sure to check those out. And you can use those for your own growth, but also the growth of your ministry team. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, we are glad to have you with us. Please give us a like, be sure to subscribe, and drop a comment below. Let us know where you're joining us from. We love to get to know our audience. If you're listening along on your favorite podcast platform, uh, again, be sure to subscribe so you do not miss out on any of these awesome conversations. Now, as I said, I'm very excited about uh, the topic for today and the guest for today. Um, I'm pleased to be joined by Jay Kim, who is a, a pastor and also a best-selling author. And we are going to get into some really great stuff, both front stage and backstage. So at this time, welcome to the show, Jay. Good to have you with us. Yeah, so happy to be on with you, Jason. Yeah, brother. Now, uh, as I was thinking about it, and it's good to be with you again, um, it's it's been a while. I think it's been over a year since you and I last jumped into a kind of a deeper conversation. But yep. you and your family um, have had some amazing updates in life and ministry over the last yeah. several months here. And so before we dive into today's topic, just uh, Jay, if you would just share a little bit of an update about uh, the Kim's Kim's life and ministry. Yeah, I think the last time we chatted, I was on staff at a church called Vintage Faith in Santa Cruz, California. I was co-leading the church there with my dear friend, Dan Kimball, who I'm sure you know some people know from his writing and his work. Um, and then in August of 2020, I made a transition um, to a church where I had been on staff before, a church uh, called Westgate Church, kind of right in the heart of Silicon Valley, a uh, multi-site church here. And um, my predecessor here, Steve Clifford, who's a hero of mine and a mentor and a dear friend. He had led this church for 20 years as the lead pastor. And actually going all the way back to 2018, uh, he and the elders had begun a discussion with me about potentially coming back um, to uh, begin a succession uh, transition with him. And so at the very beginning of 2021, um, I took on the role of lead pastor at Westgate. So that's been a significant shift for us, for our family. Still very close ties to Vintage Faith. I was just texting with Dan this morning. and um, But yeah, I'm, uh, I'm uh, leading a, a, a multi-site church here in Silicon Valley now and um, learning all the ups and downs of that, but but loving every minute. So thanks for yeah. asking. Yeah, so awesome. As I've been, you know, tracking with you and, and seeing the updates and hearing reports from you about all of that and praying along with you, super exciting to to see that happening and and know there'll be great days. In fact, we'll we'll probably need to jump on um, and have another conversation in a year or two yeah. and talk about succession and, and you know transition and how that all works. Um, because yeah, would love to. I, I've really admired um, from a distance how how you guys uh, have gone about it, how Westgate has gone mm -hmm. about this the succession. And and we all know that that sometimes those things go really well and sometimes they go really sideways. And so I'm yeah. um, very excited to see how how God's been at work and the faithfulness of the leadership uh, mm -hmm. there as um, as they've you know gone and worked through this this succession plan. So but that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> and and we'll, we'll get into that for sure at some point. But yeah. um, Jay, the last time, as you said, you and I talked um, probably uh, a year ago or so, and it was at a point where, as, as we all know, those who are listening in, we were about a year into uh, this crazy thing uh, we call the pandemic, right? <laughs> and uh, so today we find ourselves about, you know, um, a, a year later. And so the world is 
is changing. It's again, you know, it's been in, in flux for quite some time, but we're getting to kind of living more into this somewhat of a post pandemic world. And over the, the past few years, even pre COVID, Jay, um, you've been investing a lot of, of energy in really kind of processing how we as people um, develop spiritually, specifically kind of in, in the digital age in which we find ourselves, which is yeah. absolutely fascinating, fascinating work. And and what's been so interesting to, to see, and I know that uh, um, you, you have probably reflected on this a lot over these last couple of years, um, it's fascinating that you've you've been taking this on and really focusing in on this during this time because really, um, what other time in our lives, Jay, have things changed so dramatically? And has yeah. there been such this um, interesting uh, attention, if you will, between kind of analog life and digital life um, yeah. because of the pandemic and, and really what that did? And um, it, it feels like it's been a lifetime, but it's only been what you know two <laughs> two and a half years. Uh, but it feels like it's been been forever. So Jay, to kind of start off, um, I'd love to to get just a, a feel a sense from you on how the experiences of you know the last two two and a half years, um, how have those either changed or challenged or maybe reinforced? Mm. Um, a lot of the things that you've been experiencing and understanding about spiritual formation in the digital age. Yeah, I mean, you're right. The two and a half years have felt like two and a half decades. You know, <laughs> um, it's hard to remember sometimes life before this pandemic. It just feels like it's it's changed things in such pervasive ways. Yeah, you know, as I've reflected on it. Um, like you mentioned, uh, I, I wrote this book, Analog Church, and it released the same month that we went into lockdown. So I released a book arguing for embodied in-person church right as that was not possible. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that was an interesting, uh, it was an interesting experience, but it was actually, in hindsight, incredibly helpful because it forced not just me, but all of us to live uh, in the juxtaposition between uh, embodied in person and digital and um, being uh, connected for sure. You know, I don't argue that digital connection isn't connection at all. It is a, a form of connection. But, you know, I think if the last two and a half years have taught us anything, it's taught us that while there is much to be grateful for when it comes to technology, um, it does fall short in terms of the most human sorts of connections we can have. And I think maybe that's the thing that uh, in some ways they feel opposed, but that's the main thing I've, I've learned in these last two and a half years. Simultaneously, my gratitude for digital technology has increased and my longing for analog embodied realities and my belief that the church at its essence is um at least at her finest it is an embodied reality where real people gather in a real place uh at a real time um both of those things again i know it feels like they're probably opposed to each other but for me they've both increased in uh in tremendous ways so i think it's you know for church leaders and for pastors it is imperative that we navigate um, not a balance, but the intersection at which both digital and analog coexist. Um, it's really imperative that we navigate that intersection thoughtfully and carefully and contextually. You know, I I don't believe that there is a sort of monolithic answer or solution to the problem. I think pastoral calling is first and foremost a calling to faithfulness, faithfulness to God, and then faithfulness to the congregations and communities that we are called to. And when we talk about America, America is like 12 different countries in one country. I mean, <laughs> right. it's such a, you know, you go from one city to the next, and so much of it is different. And so much of the context and the way people think about life, the pace of life, um, accessibility to particular uh, you know, technologies, um, all of that stuff has a, a tremendous impact on 
our pastoral calling. But what is universal, I've come to believe in the last two and a half years especially, what's universal is that every church leader, every pastor needs to do the work. We need to put in the time and the energy and pray and fast and exegete uh, not just the scriptures, but exegete our cities and our towns and our neighborhoods and our people and their lives um, to as faithfully as possible serve them well and hopefully guide them closer to Christ together. So that's what the last two and a half years have, have taught me. Yeah, that, that's so, so well said. It's, I think it's very interesting because you talk about um, the intersection. I love I love the word intersection. You know, in my mind, I, I think tension, but um, and although there is some tension, I, yeah. I like intersection. It's a lot more positive, right? Because uh, <laughs> you know, there's this coexistence that that we understand. Um, but but when you were mentioning the idea that our um, kind of appreciation for things digital has increased during the the last two and a half years, but then also our intense appreciation for you know relationship and gathering yeah. and and being together has also you know exponentially i think increased and and we yeah. and we hear that in in so many people's stories and and kind of the story of the world right now um which is fascinating to think that uh both those things could happen simultaneously yeah. and you know they're, they're, they don't necessarily have to you know pull apart from one another but there right. can be a, a, a appreciation on both sides so i think that's a that's a great insight brother um now, I, I really want us to tackle um, this this idea of spiritual formation in the digital age from kind of two angles, Jay. And, and, and you made this easy on us because um, you've you've done this yourself in, in your own work. <laughs> so this is going to be incredible for, for our audience. And so here are the two approaches that we're going to look at, and, and both are very different. The first focuses on, you know, the front stage. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts from the perspective of, uh, a local church pastor, a pastor looking at the ministries in, in their own context, the ministries of the local church, how can we be more effective in really uh, developing Christ followers through the life of our local church congregation, right? So, so that's one side in, in, in the midst of a digital age. Mm-hmm. Um, but then we want to go backstage as well, and we want to look at um, our, our lives uh, personally as pastors, you know, and this kind of picks up more of what you share in your newest book, Analog Christian. And I'd love for you to speak to the backstage life of of us as pastors. You yeah. know, to our own our own soul care, our own um, spiritual formation, mm-hmm. uh, what that looks like personally for us. And you know, specifically in in this digital age. And so, uh, like I said, you've you've kind of set this up because uh, your first book. Um, analog church, uh, which is absolutely fascinating. This kind of focuses on more that front stage stuff. Yeah. Um, your next book, which is is releasing um, here very shortly, called yeah. Analog Christian, um, that kind of focuses more on kind of our, our spiritual and kind of our own personal reflects on our personal development, which is awesome. And and yeah. and just real quickly for our audience, um, I want to let them know that. Um, we have an opportunity. We're going to be giving away copies of both Analog Church and Analog Christian to one of our audience members. So if you're on YouTube, make sure that you like, subscribe, and comment below. Leave your name and your church's name. If you're listening on on a podcast, uh, jump over to YouTube and uh, make sure you comment and subscribe so that we can uh, select one of you. Super excited. You will have a chance to win both of these books, both Analog Church and Analog Christian. And thank you, uh, Jay, for sharing these with our audience. So, um, so let's let's kind of dive into this, all right? Let's start with the front stage. As a pastor, Jay, um, what what do we need to really kind of consider when it comes to making disciples? When it comes to shepherding our people, shepherding our churches um, in, in this intersection of both analog and digital? Yeah, in some ways, I mean that is the question, you know. So I, I guess. Uh, Initially, my response to the to the question is that the question itself is the response. That in all that we do, as we serve and lead our churches, the way you frame the question, Jason, I think is so spot on. You know, I, I'm a believer in metrics. I I don't have a problem with uh, measuring numbers, and you know, I think there is a healthy way to 
uh, keep an eye on attendance and giving and all of those things are critically important. But I would suggest that they are critically important in so much as they reveal to you a glimpse of um, your effectiveness as a, a pastor and as a church, uh, your effectiveness in actually forming and shaping um, you know, disciples, followers of Jesus who are uh, orbiting their lives around Christ, learning and living the way of Jesus in whatever context they find themselves. So what comes to mind for me is what is the primary question you are asking? You know, why do you do what you do? And why do you do even the nuts and bolts stuff of what you do? Why do you preach? You know, why do you sing songs? Why do you gather in a particular space? Why do you ask people to gather in homes, in small groups or life groups or whatever you call them uh, in your context? What is the end goal? You know, and I think for me, at least, my best understanding of scripture, uh, it seems to be clear. You know, there's the famous, very well known Great Commission in Matthew 18 when. Jesus, his parting words, I mean, his sort of final mandate to these young men who will eventually give rise to the Christian church. He says to them, go and make, you know, not good people, not good moral people, uh, go and make not people who know how to sit and listen to a sermon for 30 minutes or sing the songs or um, give a lot of money to the church. He says, go and make disciples. And if you extrapolate that concept out, it actually leads to all of those other nuts and bolts things that we're talking about. Um, people who are following the way of Jesus, living and embodying the way of Jesus, they inevitably at some point grow to a place where they do all of those things that we're uh, so interested in, in having our people do. You know, show up to church, give, serve, join a small group, um, give to the needy, go on a mission trip, outreach, community service, all of those things, you know, how it impacts marriages and parenting and relationships and career, faith and vocation and all of those things. But those things are byproducts of a life being formed into the image of the risen Christ. And I think we need to be able to answer that question honestly. We need to be able to answer that question uh, you know, with very clear eyes. And I think sometimes for me as a pastor, I have a tendency um, to uh, essentially surround whatever it is that's happening in our church with a particular narrative. I mean, the reality is pastors are prone to hyperbole. You know, it's kind of in our nature. We're, we're preachers uh, at heart and preachers, when, when we're not careful, we're prone to hyperbole. So it's pretty easy for us. Most pastors are really good at talking, you know, right. it's pretty easy for a pastor um, to couch everything in the positive and to um, stretch uh, the malleability of words to frame everything within the context of discipleship and formation into Christ likeness and all those things. But I think we have to really be honest with ourselves by defining what we mean when we say people in our congregations are learning and living the way of Jesus, um, living a life of discipleship to Jesus, apprenticing to Jesus, whatever the language in your context may be, we have to be really clear about what we mean. And that clarity has to play out in like practical, pragmatic, real life, real time ways. And so that that's the first thing I would say. And as it juxtaposes with the digital age, there's so much to say here. But one of the things I would say is that the digital age um, is, by its nature, it is becoming increasingly, uh, online spaces are becoming increasingly performative spaces. You know, they're places where people go to perform. And pastors, if we're not careful, we are also prone to performance. You know, your sermon can very easily become a performative monologue that you've crafted to impress the masses. And the sermon at its finest, I think all of us would agree, is not that at all. But rather, it's lots of things, but I would suggest one of the things it is, uh, is an honest rendering of um, the, the truth of God and the gospel of Jesus and the way that confronts the idolatry and the lies uh, that we're living and embodying, you know, 
I, I think a lot about the the prophetic literature and um, the prophetic tradition. You know, these guys were not popular in their day. <laughs> I mean, right. everybody quotes that verse from Jeremiah 29, you know, 11. For I know the plans I have for you to prosper you. And everybody loves that verse and puts it on coffee mugs. But if you read the entirety of Jeremiah, it is like one of the most depressing reads of all time. It right. is not a fun book. And prophets were not popular. And what I'm not saying is that pastors should be downers. I'm not saying that pastors should just, um, you know, uh, critique. I don't think pastors should critique. But I do think there is a very important distinction between critique and confrontation. And while I do not believe that pastors are called to critique our people, I do believe we are called to confront idolatrous lies. Uh, with the truth of the gospel. And sometimes that is going to be difficult, but I believe it's always going to be hopeful. And uh, in the digital age, it's really easy to lean on performance. And typically what you want from a performance is the applause of the masses. You want them to clap and smile on their way out and make sure that they're coming back for more, you know, uh, the next week. And that's not a bad thing. We want to, we want to draw people in absolutely. And, uh, make sure that they understand they're, they're welcome and invited. Um, but I think the path forward there, uh, is to be really honest about the state of our lives and the condition of our, of our souls. And I think that's a part of what it means to say yes to the calling of pastoral faithfulness. So there's a lot to say there. I've already said a lot, but those are a few thoughts that come to mind. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great, Jay. And the, the honesty piece I think is interesting when you think of honesty in, in person, you know, gathering people together and honesty um, on the digital front, mm. um, you know, people can be dishonest anywhere. Yeah. But as we look at the digital world, uh, what we tend to see um, are are the the best of everyone's lives, you know, the yes. best moments of everyone's lives. Yes. So it's the highlights. It, yes, exactly. And so, and you can control that digitally, <laughs> whereas yeah. you can't necessarily control that, you know, if you're living in community with with people around you, right? And right. so, I, I think that's that's a, a a very important point that you've made there in regard to that honesty piece, because um, if we're not careful um, in the you know, in the digital realm, we can we can cover up a lot of the authenticity yeah. of of what it means to be, um, you know, living lives um, honoring Jesus. You know, yeah. and, and we we like you said, we always want to celebrate the the beauty of it. Um, yeah. But there's there's challenges. I mean, and Christ Christ told us Himself, you know, that there would be trouble. We would see trouble uh, in yeah. this world, but uh, you know, but we wouldn't be alone in the midst of that. And so there are right. there are you know, highlights, but there are also valleys and there are also challenges. And so I think that idea of honesty in, in recognizing that, um, that in the digital space, it's much, much easier and not only much easier, but it's, it's very tempting quite mm -hmm. honestly to, uh, cause you can edit things out, right. <laughs> and, and you yeah. can make things look, look really good. So, uh, um, yeah. I think that's important to that's keep in mind. Cool. Yeah. Um, so that, that's kind of looking at the front stage piece of it as, as pastors and ministry leaders, you, you were talking a little bit about being very clear about what it means, um, to be a disciple maker or to be a follower of Jesus and what that looks like. Can you give us some, um, maybe some, some examples of what that clarifying process either looks like or, or some examples of even you in your own local context, whenever you are saying, okay, you get your team together, you're prayerfully looking at, okay, what exactly are we, as you said, how, how do we answer that question? What does it mean to be, a, you know, a spiritually um, formed follower of Jesus? So, so yeah. help us with that clarity a bit. Yeah, that's great. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll use our context, you know, cause that's Perfect. the context I live in. So I'll just share. And, and by no means is this sort of like, Hey, we've, figured it out we have not <laughs> <laughs> right yeah uh, we're, we're just like everybody listening we're just learning and kind of building the plane as we fly and right. especially post covid you know we just did a survey at our church and um uh 
33%, one in three people who are attending our services on Sunday now uh, have told us that they are at least 33% of those who took the survey. And it was a lot of people who took the survey. 33% have been at our church for one year or less. Wow. So it's not even it's not even the start of COVID. It's like in the middle of COVID, they started watching us online or attending in person. Um, and then uh, nearly 50% of our church has been here two years or less. So half of our church are COVID folks. <laughs> they found, found us during COVID. Yeah, that's so, fascinating. One of the things that's done for us is it's, it's actually forced us. It's been a real gift. It's forced us to reimagine uh, how and how often um, and with what language we communicate our values. So for us, you know, what we say here is that uh, Westgate Church is a, a group of ordinary people who are learning and living the way of Jesus in Silicon Valley. And for us, what that means is um, to become a people who we talk about the three loves at our church a lot. Again, it's not rocket science. We didn't invent it. It's from the scriptures and lots of churches use this language. But we talk about the three loves, you know, God's call, Jesus's call specifically to love God, um, to love our neighbors as ourselves, and to love one another, to love uh, the brothers and sisters who make up uh, this family in the context of our local church that we belong to. So the way we do it is uh, we have an introductory class um, called intro. It's just called intro. Um, and it's, uh, it's like a mixture of in-person and video. So uh, the beginning session and the, the ending session are all in person. And then there's a series of nine videos that you watch. And those videos essentially get into the values of our church which is essentially our rendering of what it means to be a disciple, to follow Jesus. So those nine videos, they get into the, these three loves. And essentially what we do, again, answering your question, how do we practically do this at our church? We explain what we mean by love. Um, and the reason that's important for us is because uh, culturally, love, the word love is elastic. It means all right. sorts of things to all sorts of people. So we try to do some work on um, what the Bible means when it uses the word love. And then we explain, at least in our context here in Silicon Valley, where it is very post-Christian, very unchurched, 90-something um, percent of our area have no um, church affiliation. Uh, we try to explain what we mean when we say the word God. Because uh, uh, also God means all mm -hmm. sorts of things to all sorts of people. So we're digging into like the name Yahweh. And, um, you know, we're talking about uh, a particular uh, person when we say God. Um, and then we also offer alpha here, you know. So a lot of folks who have questions uh, at, at that point, uh, they'll they'll transition into alpha. And that's been really helpful for us. And then And then we just do the same exact thing. What? Uh, what is this? What do the scriptures mean when it says neighbor? Who is our neighbor? What does it mean to love them? Uh, and then we'll do some work on one another, and we'll do some work on the church and why the church matters, and what the church is, and what it means. Uh, why it's important that the scriptures use familial language to describe the church, and what that means for our connection uh, with one another. So. Um, you know, there's, that's like nine weeks worth of, of content, but uh, that's essentially how we do it. We just try to go piece by piece, um, explaining each of those loves. And, uh, and we've seen some, some really good fruit from that. Yeah, it's awesome. Thank you for, for sharing that kind of real life example of, of that, uh, because that is one of the things that I think um, every local church, um, as you said, we're wrestling with because we do need to be clear. And uh, the more kind of we find ourselves in a post-Christendom world, the yeah. clearer we need to be, honestly. Yep. So I, I appreciate right. the work that you guys are doing there. That's awesome. All right, so front stage, awesome. Let's go backstage now um, for our personal spiritual formation. And again, this this uh, aligns a lot more with your, your most recent book, Analog Christian, a lot of things that you you share there. So what do we need to be paying, to, paying attention to ourselves as pastors, as ministry leaders, um, when it comes to 
our own spiritual development, spiritual formation in, in the digital age. Yeah, you know, um, the writer, uh, James K. Smith, Jamie Smith, he's got this fantastic book called You Are What You Love. And uh, I'm sure lots of people listening or watching have, have read it. Uh, it's an incredible book. And he's got this line in the book where he says, human beings live leaning forward. And what he means by that is that every human on the planet, every human in the history of humans uh, has always lived with um, a telos. And a telos is a word that essentially means like an end. Uh, that essentially your life is headed in a particular direction and that you do not have a choice in the matter. Every human lives leaning forward. We live with a particular end in mind. Um, the only choice we have is which direction. And if we are not aware, if we're not careful, if we're not intentional, then the, 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 the telos or the end or the direction of our lives will be dictated to us by whatever whatever mediums, whatever realities are most most pervasive in our lives. And my concern has been for a very long time that in the digital age in particular, because online realities and the internet and social media and news media, because those things are so pervasive in our lives, if we do not live with intention, then our lives will be formed. We have no choice in the matter. Our lives will be formed by those realities, by the digital age, by the internet, by social media, by news media, and the stories and the narratives that they tell us about what is true and not true about the world and our lives. And so uh, for me, um, you know, as I think about pastors and church leaders, but as I also think about just people in our church, the, the men and women and the, and the kids that I, I feel called to serve and to lead, um, that's one of my greatest concerns. So I often think about the work we're doing here at our church as um, work to not only form disciples, but actually maybe first and foremost, or at least initially, to unform disciples, unform disciples of the digital age so that they might then become disciples of Jesus in the way of Jesus. And again, it's not black and white. It's not like, you know, the internet is diametrically opposed to the gospel. Uh, the internet is just a medium. It's just a tool. Right. This is something I say in my first book, An Analog Church. Tools um, are all moral. They're amoral, basically. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that they have a morality in and of themselves necessarily. Although you could make an argument that social media and the algorithms do kind of have an inherent morality. But if you take like a hammer, for example, a hammer doesn't have a built-in morality. A hammer can be used, used to build up something really beautiful, and a hammer can be used to actually destroy stuff. You know, it right. just depends on intention. And so um, that that's really, for me, uh, maybe the, the most critical initial piece. How much intentionality are we living with? You know, are we aware of um, the things that are forming us? And if those things are not forming us into the likeness of Christ, how willing are we? How much courage? How much conviction? How much discipline are we willing to lean into in order to detach in a healthy way and to unform ourselves from those formative powers? and to attach ourselves to the way of Jesus in such a way that we grow more and more like him, you know, in our daily lives. So um, in a nutshell, that's kind of what Analog Christian is about. And, and more specifically, what I have discovered is, you know, Paul's words near the end of his letter to the Galatians, where he talks about keeping in step with the Spirit and um, embodying and bearing, you know, the spirit bearing fruit in our lives and those characteristics of the spirit's fruit, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. What I've realized is that those, those characteristics of the spirit's fruit are actually the antidotes to so much that ails us in the digital age. So I think essentially what it comes down to is can we be the sort of people who live with such a deep hunger and desire for the things of God 
and invite God by his spirit to actually bear fruit in us, not just become Christians who get a golden ticket to heaven when we die, but to be the sorts of people here and now in the day to day uh, who ask God by his spirit to come alive in us and to bear fruit in us. And if we can do that, I think the natural byproduct will, will be uh, that so much of that which, again, ails us in the digital age, so many of the ill effects of social media and news media and all of the intake of the internet, um, so much of that will come undone as the spirit of God bears fruit in us. So um, that's my hope with the book. That's my hope with uh, you know our people that we serve here. Yeah, that, that's so solid. And I so appreciate, Jay, how you kind of flesh that out and, and, and kind of lay that out. Um, I know that you, you write a lot about, uh, you know, ideas of like contentment and resiliency. Yeah. And, and as I think of pastors, you know, um, shepherding a, a church, uh, those two things, one contentment and the other resiliency are, are, are two things that, um, have really come to the forefront in the last uh, couple of years, especially I think in, in our lives as, as ministry leaders. So can you speak just, um, just quickly to uh, each of those areas and how they apply, you know, as pastor to a pastor, you know, um, thinking through the idea of contentment and then also that idea of resiliency. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much to say here. I, I think contentment, again, going back to the characteristics of the fruit of the spirit, I think that the, you know, the fruit of the spirit, the way Paul writes it out, it's there's, they're sort of set as a triad. So they, they come in threes. And, you know, the first three, love, joy, and peace, I think love, joy, and peace speak to the contentment we long for. I think one of the reasons why maybe we don't experience contentment the way we, we want is because we have a, a misunderstanding of what love, joy, and peace actually are. So often people think that love is um, sort of an emotional reaction or a feeling we have because, you know, it's the butterflies in the stomach when you meet that girl, you know, for the first time or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, you know, my, my argument is that love is actually a vocation. Love is a calling to um, live a particular way. And that, you know, just as the human heart, it, it exists and keeps our bodies alive in a constant flow of receiving and giving. You know, it receives blood from one ventricle and then it oxygenates and then it gives blood uh, through the other ventricle and then it flows through the whole body. And then that same blood is received again by the heart to be reoxygenated and, and to once again be given away so that the body stays alive. Like literally our physical bodies maintain life in a constant never-ending flow of receiving and giving. Uh, well, not never ending, about 80 years and then it ends. But, right, right, right. You know, that's that's what keeps you alive. And I think love is the same exact way. Um, you most deeply experience love uh, and receive love as you give it away. It's the work of giving it away that actually ends up giving you love, you know, and that leads to contentment. And the same with joy. I think joy often is equated with, you know, happy feelings. And in fact, joy is so much more than that. You know, joy is the ability uh, to, to find meaning in both the ups and downs of life. It's the sort of sustaining energy that undergirds um, both the mountaintops and the valleys and the long plateaus in between. And so once we tap into that, once we understand that joy is not predicated on circumstances or things um, working out or breaking our way, but rather it is a gift from God that sustains us, that leads us to incredible contentment. Uh, and then peace, you know, peace is, many of us know this, peace is not just the absence of chaos or violence. Peace in the biblical literature is, uh, in the Hebrew, it's the word shalom, which is actually the rightness of all things and the rightness and the putting right of relationships and systems and, um, you know, in our own hearts and minds. And so if we can pursue the shalom of God, uh, that too, I think, leads to, to contentment. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to resilience, I mean, I, I think we could all use more resilience. And that second triad of the fruit of the spirit, you know, the characteristics of patience and kindness and goodness, 
Um, I think that leads to resilience. I think often we think of, you know, when we think of resilient people, uh, we, we imagine people with clenched fists and, you know, teeth clenched and fists clenched and like, no matter what you do, I'm going to outlast you sort of thing, right. you know, and that's not untrue, but actually I think biblical resilience, you know, you think about the upside down kingdom of God. And you think about the way Jesus did everything. I mean, literally spending time with the people he shouldn't have spent time with, going to parties he should not have gone to, um, winning victory over sin and death by dying. You know, just everything about it is backwards and upside down. And I think Christian resilience is the same way. Christian resilience is far less clenching our fists and standing in opposition to anybody who stands against us, but rather it's living with patience. And it's exuding kindness and goodness in the face of utter hostility, you know, in our world. And especially in the digital age where, where everyone is hostile, everyone is, uh, you know, antagonistic, where on social media, everyone is shouting and screaming at one another. The most resilient thing you can do uh, is to be patient and to be kind and to be good. Um, to those who are maybe not kind and good to you, patient with those who are impatient with you, you know, and that's resilience. That's actually true resilience that gives you the strength to stand in for the long haul. And uh, especially for pastors today, when I think about all of the data regarding how many pastors have left the ministry or are seriously considering leaving the ministry. Um, I think resilience, meaning living with patience and kindness and goodness in our hearts and exuding those realities, I think it's one of the critical components of pastoral ministry uh, in our day and age. Yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, Jay. Um, I, I love how you break that down um, and how you share that with us. And I know you go into much more detail in, in Analog Christian. And I certainly appreciate that because I, I just love how you provide the, the framework, you know, out of... Um, the, the fruit of the spirit and and that just provides great great framework great guidance for us as we're kind of digging in in that way man it's been mm -hmm. such a great conversation as it always is with you Jay and I certainly appreciate you making the time to be here with us if uh, our, our audience would like to connect with you what's the best way they can do that yeah um, best way is I, I have a little website it's just jkimthinks.com and all my stuff is there and then um yeah i'd love to chat with you if you have any questions or thoughts or if there's anything i can do to help you just email me it's just my first name j j a y at jkimthinks.com awesome brother and we will have um links to all the things that were mentioned including both analog church and analog christian um jay's jay's books we'll have those available in the uh the weekly toolkit, which is a downloadable toolkit that you can use with your ministry team to help you guys grow deeper and to dig more deeply into this very important conversation uh, that we've just had here with, with Jay. You can find that at pastorserve.org slash network. And also be sure um, for your opportunity to win a copy of both Analog Church and Analog Christian um, to uh, on YouTube, like, subscribe, and then drop a comment with your name and church name. We love to get that out to you. I have one, one lucky winner. So um, again, it's been so great to be with you, Jay. Certainly appreciate it, my friend. Uh, God bless you. And thank you for making the time to hang out with us here on Front Stage Backstage. Yeah, absolutely. It was an honor, Jason. Thank you. Now, before you go, I want to remind you of an incredible free resource that our team puts together every single week to help you and your team dig more deeply and maximize the conversation that we just had. This is the weekly toolkit that we provide, and we understand that it's one thing to listen or watch uh, an episode but it's something entirely different to actually take what you've heard, what you've watched, what you've seen, and apply it to your life and to your ministry. You see, Front Stage Backstage is more than just a podcast or YouTube show about ministry leadership. We are a complete resource to help train you and your entire ministry team as you seek to grow and develop in life and ministry. Every single week, we provide a weekly toolkit which has all types of tools in it to help you do just that. Now you can find this at pastorserve.org network. 
That's pastorserve.org slash network. And there you'll find all of our shows, all of our episodes, and all of our weekly toolkits. Now, inside the toolkit are several tools, including video links and audio links for you to share with your team. There are resource links about different resources and tools that were mentioned in the conversation, several other tools, but the greatest thing is the Ministry Leaders Growth Guide. Our team pulls key insights and concepts from every conversation with our amazing guests. And then we also create engaging questions for you and your team to consider and process, providing space for you to reflect on how that episode's topic relates to your unique context at your local church, in your ministry, and in your life. Now you can use these questions in your regular staff meetings to guide your conversation as you invest in the growth of your ministry leaders. You can find the weekly toolkit at pastorserve.org slash network. We encourage you to check out that free resource. Until next time, I'm Jason Day, encouraging you to love well, live well, and lead well. God bless.